going to introduce the panel. We have Daniel Birnbaum, the Artistic Director of Acute Art, Marcello Dantas, the Director of the Sefer Ik Muse Ion at Tulum, Mexico. Sferic. I've mispronounced, I'm sure, every <laughs> single part of that. Sferic. Um Luca de Michelis, who is the CEO of Marsilio Editori and Marsilios, Marsilios, uh, Marsilio Art, and Freya Salway, the head of the lab of Google Arts and Culture. So welcome all. Um, we're going to talk about AI and creativity. When I think about AI uh, in general, whether it's with regards to the arts or anything else, I think most people tend to fall into one of three camps. The first is the evangelist, the person who sees AI as exciting, as the inevitable wave of the future, and as something almost entirely positive. Then, of course, we have uh, the uh, people who look at AI with terror, that see nothing but plagiarism, regurgitation, um, derivative, uh, creativity. And then the third group is the denialist, uh, the person who um, sort of feels like you can sit it out like crypto, it'll come and it'll go, and perhaps you don't have to pay any attention to it at all. And I have to admit that I was part of the denialist camp. I thought I'm not gonna get all, you know, have my Kubrick uh, fears of uh, AI taking over the world. I'll just wait for it to, to leave and not have to learn about it like crypto. But as a journalist, I have to say, I have, uh, and an author, I've fallen into the terror camp, um, and a few headlines have recently pushed me there. Uh, one, in the realm of journalism, there was a story in the Times this week, you may have seen about what is called a AI chop shop, um, BNN breaking. Perhaps you've seen this online, um, but it is a, it looks like a news source, um, and in fact, it's basically stories that have been written almost entirely uh, with AI, often mirroring the political intentions of the founder, a capricious person who sometimes takes vengeance out on journalists or ideas or politicians that he doesn't like. Um, there's another one called Copy Cop, which is mostly in French, and it will do things like instruct, it'll tell AI, to please rewrite this article taking a conservative stance against the liberal policies of the Macron administration in favor of working class French citizens. So for journalists, this is quite frightening because there is, of course, the threat that it'll take journalists out of the equation entirely, um, but more so there's the idea of the audience and will they know the difference between something that is created by a human being and something that is created by a machine. And then another thing that, that threw me into a bit of a, a, the terror stance uh, was a, a, an illustrator that I admire, a uh, Norwegian illustrator named ben Bendik Kaltenborn, posted on Instagram uh, last week that he is feeling like he needs to take all of his work off of meta platforms because on June 26, um, if you don't uh, sort of opt out or sign an agreement, all of the work will be scraped and then someone will be able to take the kind of work, his style, and reproduce it without obviously him involved. Um, so I'm coming at this as a skeptic. I think that our panelists um, may have a different view on this. And of course, very timely, we have the art newspaper headline today, the art world's AI dilemma, um, talking about some of the threats, but also some of the possibilities. So I thought I would start with an open question, and I think I may know the answer to some of this, but where on that spectrum would each of you consider yourself? Which camp would you fall in and why? We can start with you. Should I start? Yeah. I'm exactly at the middle. <laughs> no, I'm... Um, the thing is that I'm working with the digital art. Since a few years, um, I, I work for a kind of a labora laboratory or an atelier for, for, for digital uh, experimentation, and we have produced works that are entirely digital. Uh, so, uh, virtual reality pieces, augmented reality pieces. And if you're already in the digital realm, of course, a a AI is simply a possibility. It's a, it's a tool. Um, 
you know, things come and go, as you say, and people thought that there was such a thing as NFT art. NFTs, you know, blockchain, that's more to do with writing contracts and ownership, and there is no aesthetics inside the NFT as a possibility. And the same with, um, with AI. It's a much more fundamental tool that will probably change most of our activities, including journalism and design, and as, as you already said. But um, among the works that we produced recently, some by very young artists, but also you know, by very established artists. We started out with uh, Marina Abramovic and, and, uh, and uh, Ula for Eliasson and people like that. There were modest AI components, and it's nothing to do with the total apocalypse of you know, changing everything or dismissing it. It is actually functioning. And uh, you know, there, there are many, many ways to work with, with AI, and now I make it maybe less dramatic, the whole thing, but of course there is this uh, possibility to, you know, what is called generative AI. Mm -hmm. um, so that refers to a kind of, well, deep learning models that can generate high quality imagery, text, sound, based on the data they were trained on. And of course, that is, you know, um, a possibility for machines producing stuff that will look very much like real literature, real journalism, real art. Um, in the art world, of course, artworks produced by machines is really nothing new. You know, the ready-made is that. That's more than 100 years ago. Uh, uh, you know, a bottle rack, uh, something produced. It's, uh, uh, it's all in the eyes of the beholder, if you want. And I think we are still at least partly human. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, 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 and, and, you know, that we are at least a little bit not entirely artificial. So, I mean, art will, and, you know, the ready-made... A, a concept produced or created by Marcel Duchamp. Uh, and he was the person who said, you know, the viewer adds or contributes at least 50%. So I think we're not going to have a world where machines produce wor uh, art for machines. I think we will have hybrid forms of creativity where things that are a little bit outside of us, bigger than us, contribute. And that's where AI is, is kind of at the moment. So bring this down a little bit down to earth to us because sometimes it's hard to understand what exactly it is an artist will do with AI. So Marina Abramovich, you just said, did a, did a, a something a collaboration using AI. Can you describe exactly what that what that what did that look like? What was that? I mean, the early works that we did with the virtual reality had very m modest AI components, but I mean, we did something with Jeff Koons and. Uh, a ballerina, which is more beautiful than any real ballerina. No, so it can be, you know, perf it's a tool to perfectionize things. And actually, there were modest AI elements in that, because the ballerina, second time you enter the piece, she recognizes you. Uh, so it can be things like that. We did a tiny piece, a, 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 an augmented reality piece with um, Ku jong Ah, who is in the Korean pavilion here. A very interesting artist. It's, it was the first... Uh, augmented reality piece to be shown at an art fair, I think, or at least it was in, um, in um, part of free sculpture. So it was in the most conventional of contexts, the Royal Park in London. One object was not really there. It was you know, only visible through iPhones or, or, or iPads. It was hovering there. And uh, I remember um, we did this with Victoria, who's I think here, uh, and, and she wrote, I mean, she talked to the press, to the Guardian, saying this piece had very little uh, carbon footprint because it was brought without creating, without any insurance, without all of that. But anyhow, that piece has intelligence in it. It grows, you know, it, it reflects its audience uh, and, and its environment. In the park, it's green and beautiful. In, in the suburbs, it looks a little bit more urban and gray. Uh, and in the evening, it goes uh, yellow because the sun sets. Those are very modest forms, nothing to do with the kind of, uh, um, you know, with the kind of apocalyptic scenarios. And we're working, and I'm sure you will go on to Freya, yes. we're working on a small piece <laughs> that we're maybe not meant to talk much about, but it will react to the weather. And so, you know, there's this world of the unpredictable that people like. Many artists, I think, have, uh, are interested in things a little bit beyond themselves, so that the work is produced by things that is not entirely controlled. You know, it could be the unconscious, that's what we used to call it, or the divine inspiration. 
now it's maybe this massive super intelligence that we have out there. Okay, well, speaking of apocalyptic, when people like me get terrified, we often think in terms of big tech, and Google, of course, is the biggest of big tech. But where do you fall in, in your view on uh, this spectrum? How do you see AI in terms of its interactions with creative, creativity and art? Um, um, so, when you were explaining the three camps earlier, my, and so this is me personally, so my personal um, camp is a, I think there's a fourth camp where you can have, um, you can question as well as see um, the possibilities and some excitement around it as well. And I think with the emergence of any new tools, there's, it's important, and I think it's what artists do really well, is to question and push ask those questions and push those possibilities. And in terms of the work that I do, it kind of, so since 2018, 2017, 2018, we've been exploring how um, AI interacts with arts and culture, but it's very, it's working with artists, with cultural partners. So they're kind of driving the direction that that takes. And um, earlier when you were saying about kind of concrete examples, I think we did this project um, that I think is interesting because it happened in 2019, and I think there's lots of possibilities where a project like this may go, where there's a choreographer, um, amazing choreographer called Wayne McGregor, and he, was, um, he said to us, I have this 20-year body of work, and um, I'd like to have more of an active dialogue with it beyond just my memory and influence. Can... Uh, what technology can AI help? And we worked with him for over two years, and we've created, and he still uses it today, and it's a choreography tool where he um, can input a kind of a movement, and then it extends that movement based on what it's learned from its archive. But it's not mimicking, because that would be kind of derivative. But what it's doing is it's offering something new that he's then able to have a dialogue with, and that's informing his work. And I think there's some really interesting space around our relationship with personal archives for our personal learning of kind of creative process, but then on a larger scale around education, when you think of like museum collections and how it can kind of broaden a frame of reference. So that part of it, I think, is um, exciting. And then also, I think, if I try to generate an image, um, like, so I type something in and I generate an image, pff, you know, it's, it's, not going to, it's not going to win any awards, but I see artists who actually are working with this as a tool, and it's their kind of, it's that co-creation and it's their craft, how they're crafting with that tool and what they're creating and their storytelling and how they're expressing themselves. And you can create really meaningful and kind of exciting new forms of expression. So that's, yeah. That's okay, cool. so just to push you a little bit on those questions that you do ask yourself, the, the sort of fearful part or the cautious part, like what are those questions that you try to bear in mind that, you know, so as not to go maybe too far into the evangelist camp? I think with, it's how we as humans are going to use the tools. So it's like any tools um, previously, it's what we do with those. And I think, um, and also, um, something that, you know, we've been doing at Arts and Culture over many years, I think the importance of artists and creatives and creative communities being part of kind of the development of these technologies is really, really important. And it's always kind of, I think, coming back to that and um, also being mindful of how, how we as humans will kind of interact with these um, models. We were having a conversation the yeah. other day and uh, Marcella had an interesting analogy with fire. Yeah. So. Yeah, if you put it in perspective, it's like uh, AI has this importance. Maybe fire or maybe rocket. You know, fire is something that we could, has changed completely humanity, and we could have used it in different ways. Rocket is the same. I mean, you could send a rocket to explore space, or you can make it a missile to kill somebody. AI is the same. Uh, what we tried to do, we established the first open call for artists around the world. We gave $100,000 for the winning artists uh, and four residencies to other artists to develop a AI work that would be a platform to speak with another species. I think this is the most 
powerful territory, the most interesting to me. I mean, just the ability that one brain will be able to speak all languages, all human languages, but soon enough, the same brain will be able to speak languages of other species. This is magnificent in our existence. We will be able to understand what others are saying and we'll be able to communicate with them, not via the colonizer language. Because if you try to translate between Bantu and Swahili, you're going to have to go to English or to French or to something else that will dilute that meaning. I mean, the ability that in AI you could go into a, into a camp in which all these lexicons exist and allow you to open up gateways, this is a unique potential. And we shouldn't fear it. We should be dazzled by the power that it has. You know, we will transform our way of thinking because it's the thinking modes. You're never going to be able to speak 7,000 languages, but you can understand the thinking modes of different languages put on the same brain and platform to allow you to interpret problems and think of problems differently. And uh, this is extremely powerful. I'm extremely enthusiastic about it. <laughs> As of last week, uh, our first project, Daniel was part of that journey. Uh, it's been developed for six months now. Uh, they are observing bats. And they are recording bat language, and they are observing bats, you know, observing the bats' behavior. And we came to a conclusion that we now know the words that bats use for yes and no. This is a landmark. This allows you to get somewhere that, where, there is, where the new problem exists. Now, if you're able to speak back to a bat, this is a question that is quintessential to us. What would you say? You know, what doors does it open? And these tools will bring questions that we were not even thinking of. You know, and this is a fantastic tool for creativity. It will enhance our minds. I mean, all this data that we have collected, it is a raw material. It is a fantastic raw material that otherwise would be in trash. And artists have the, the fantastic talent to turn trash into something good throughout the times. So can we take all the trash that we are producing, all the information trash, and turn it into something tangible? And then the question goes to museums. Will museums be able to understand that the algorithm, the code, is the work of art? That it becomes tangible because it is an idea, and it is a kind of idea that will forever change and be interpreted and change with the amount of input that you put inside. So this is a, a question comes up with regard to disclosure, an ethical question, right? Do you always need to disclose the fact that AI is part, of, in part, the creator of the art? Yes. Do but, all of you believe that? But that just like the collective consciousness is, is part of the creation of any artist. No artist is alone. No artist is outside of references. No artist came out without any study. You know, artists come out, out of, a, of a place, and AI is now this place. And yes, AI is an author just like the collective consciousness is. You know, and we shouldn't, you know, it's so ridiculous to talk about copyright in this moment in time. I mean, there's not, not a single piece of music that is not influenced by another piece of music. Luca, I know you wanted to talk a little bit about copyright as well. Yeah. <clears throat> First, uh, um, a few words of introduction of myself. The, the other panelists uh, work all for very distinguished institutions. Uh, uh, Marsilio is a publisher, and is a publisher based in Venice. Uh, and in our over 60 years publisher, we work a lot uh, around art. Actually, we are partner of uh, most of the institutions that work around art in Venice. We organize exhibition, we run museums, we are we have a deep involvement in the art world in general in Italy and in Venice in particular. Now. Um, I'm very interested about the, the topic of AI and probably on the most positive uh, front uh, for reasons that different from, I think, every other panelist I heard here today. Um, in the sense that uh, I'm more interested what uh, art can do for AI rather than AI can do for art. I believe we are living in a time uh, with uh, uh, where there is innovation, uh, but there is no progress. And uh, what I mean by that uh, is that uh, we're living probably in the, in the 
in a time where innovation, the pace of innovation has never been so fast and so overwhelming to some extent. But really the infrastructure, the cultural infrastructure of our society struggle to keep pace with, uh, with that, uh, uh, with that uh, velocity that, uh, that innovation is taking. And I think art can actually help uh, in uh, kind of bridging this gap uh, between uh, uh, this cultural infrastructure. I'll make one example, and going back to, to copyright. Uh, um, the, uh, one of the infrastructure that is struggling to keep pace is the law. Uh, the law is, uh, uh, is, is having troubles to deal with that. In fact, uh, for example, if you think about AI, and the debate uh, around the law is about copyright, which to me, and I'm a publisher, makes absolutely no sense. Uh, so the fact that you actually train uh, a, a model, uh, a software using information that are covered by copyright doesn't mean that you are using them uh, in the sense that uh, that, uh, that, that uh, is, uh, was meant to be. And so the economic transaction behind this, uh, I, I struggle to find it. I was watching, uh, I'll give you an example, I was watching a video, um, a TED talk uh, uh, some time ago, of, uh, uh, which was very successful because of its title. Its title was uh, AI is uh, uh, incredibly smart and shockingly stupid. And uh, uh, the, um, <clears throat> there was a machine learning engineer who was explaining, uh, and actually she set the task for herself uh, to teach a computer to dance. And so what they did, they put suits to, on dancers with certain marks that could be recognized by the computer, and uh, they then fed these uh, uh, dancers into the computer, and the computer had to process uh, uh, new dances. Uh, and initially, of course, the result was terrible, because uh, not only the computer couldn't understand rhythm and there was no beauty and so forth, but he didn't even know the basic rule of how the human body would move. And then, of course, with the iterations, eventually they managed to teach the computer to, to produce acceptable dances. And the, the reason of the Ted said that the idea said basically the really difficult thing is about is uh, teaching the computer common sense, mm -hmm. and that's why it makes such stupid mistakes because. Computer, <coughs> AI is difficult to program common sense into it. And uh, clearly common sense is something that we learn as kids uh, and part of the experience is individual experience and partially are actually um, collective experience. So it's very difficult to, to prescribe that to, to a machine. And I actually thought uh, exactly the opposite. What if uh, the opportunity that AI brings to us uh, is that it doesn't have the same framework, uh, the, same, the same cognitive biases that we do have, uh, the same uh, uh, cultural framework, uh, and opens up uh, new possibilities. Uh, and so I don't see that just as a tool to perform uh, new tasks and new uh, a new, a new things. Uh, and art, I think, has uh, culture in general, but art in particular, has this job uh, to really be and go beyond uh, the framework that really define us uh, as a culture today. So, uh, yes, I am a believer. So there was a, 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 an incident earlier this year where the German artist Boris Eldegsen created using AI an entirely AI-generated work of photography, and it was set to win the Sony World Photography Award. Um, before accepting it, he said, well, actually, this was created by AI, and that he said he did it to be a cheeky monkey. Um, and so, Freya, for example, you were talking earlier about um, how, you know, humans, you, you have to rely on the humans to collaborate um, in a, uh, I guess, well-intentioned way, right, to work on, uh, with AI to create art. You spoke about that as well. And Marcello, you said it's like fire, right? So it's a tool, and 
if we rely on good actors, then all goes well, right? If we rely on well-intentioned artists who are using it um, in a way where there's full disclosure and transparency about what they do, but we know that when you rely on humans, that there are always going to be bad actors. So again, uh, going back to my skeptical view, I mean, what are the threats that people who are not going into this world of AI and art, what are the threats that they could possibly pose? I mean, maybe uh, we, we can all imagine unbelievably frightening scenarios. And, and I think that's what we've also read about. I mean, there's been lots of articles, there, there's really been a number of almost apocalyptic books about the kind of post-human situation, about the superintelligence, where that new intelligence acts like some sort of, uh, I don't know, like uh, uh, Schwarzenegger uh, <laughs> type uh, person, you know, who, who, who's out to kind of kill humanity or something. But I mean, there's a sane person, uh, almost every AI guru-like person has now written something which is uh, presented as a bestseller, uh, you know, but there's a, one of the books that I actually did read carefully and which I thought was quite good is uh, uh, Mustafa Suleiman uh, um, and it's called the, uh, the Coming Wave. And it's, you know, these scenarios, the frightening scenarios often have to do or always have to do when, when AI as a tool is applied to something where it becomes frightening. And in his case, it's biology. It's synthetic biology, how we can produce new forms yes. of life. And uh, it's a huge possibility, perhaps, medical, medically, etc. Uh, but it's also a frightening scenario. When I said we're still human, um, yes, but, you know, who knows? I mean, some, of, it, uh, some of the things that he's uh, talking about sounds like the most speculative philosophical... I remember there was a French philosopher who was very, or still very influential, called Gilles Deleuze, who was, uh, you know, fantasizing, dreaming of new f forms beyond not a god, not a human being, something new, uh, you know, new forms of life. And, and, and this, um, the Coming Wave book is very sane, and it actually describes m m medical science today and AI applied to that, and it does, you know, it is frightening. I, but I it guess also can be incredible, like training in a, a prosthetic no, arm. No, no, absolutely, and that's why AI. it's applied. Yeah. Um, I mean, in in the world of uh, political journalism, of course, we know that it's you know it's an unbelievable amplifier that can be used for political unpleasant campaigns, infiltration, indoctrination, you know, manipulation. So, I mean, there are many frightening scenarios, um, but. All of this maybe has little to do with the ap application to art, but still, I mean, those are the frightening things. I want to allow time for audience questions, so I have many more things to ask you, but first, let me just open it up. If anyone here has a question, um, there is a mic, so just raise your hand. Yes. Um, can we get a mic? Thank you. Um, just some context for you, because I'm not a skepticist. I think it depends on where we are coming from, but I've been spending the last 25 years at the intersection of technology and the arts. I founded the first classical music streaming service, uh, Idajo, and come from creativity and the arts. In that context, I have um, a question. I think there are very um, seducing proposals that were coming um, from the podium, but if we look and I only look at the creative process, because the question is, where do we AI, AI apply to? So if it goes to medicine, fine. If it goes to research, fine. But if you look at the arts, and anybody who really has been working with great artists, and I think there are many world-class people here in the room, the creative process is based on suffering. It's mm -hmm. based on not finding what you want. Right. And what AI is offering, it's shortcuts, it's mental shortcuts. And we all know that we aim for instant gratification, where we can take a shortcut, we do it, but can this seriously still be called art if we apply AI to the creative process? I mean, I, I would, I mean, I love the idea that you said about suffering, because it is the other territory is metaphor. AI is incapable of creating metaphors. And art without metaphors is usually not art. 
And so this is, this is the moment in which we are faced with one thing. We are in the crossroads of human and non-human intelligence. And we have to now figure out what is that makes us human. You know, AI is going to be capable of doing 300 things that we do, maybe even better than what we do. But there are things that AI can't do. And these are the relevant things. And maybe we will see the art world separate. Because, as you know, 90% of the art produced is probably not good. You know, but there is a 10 or 1% that art is good. And then we're going to focus on that. Because other, all, all the other stuff is going to be noise. And it's going to be generic just with everything else. And the same effect goes in music and it goes in literature. There's a lot that is produced that is irrelevant. But then we're going to be very selective, first of all, with the quality of the information we're going to get, with the quality of the art that we're going to get. When we actually see art and has the suffering inside, we will recognize that as art. And we will see that that has a difference from the generic stuff that is produced with AI. But it doesn't mean that artists will not use AI as a tool to reach that point. You know, they might be able to sketch something, they might be able to pre-visualize something, or they might create, be able to access a kind of information, like a telescope is in the sky or a microscope is to the bacteria form. We will be able to see these things and then separate and create. I don't think uh, you know, there is a space for art without humans. You know, art, real art, art that is relevant, will always be made by somebody who has the essential ingredient, which is suffering. I guess the question then, too, though, who is the we, right? Because AI can also be used to judge or to filter art. I think someone was mentioning to me this morning that in the world of film, for example, they use AI tools to be able to sift out like what errors might exist. But in fact, those things may not be errors, but might be artistic judgments. It might be yeah. the sort of the grittiness, the humanity of the, of the work. While there is a, a human audience, there will always be somebody to judge. I hope so. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? We have a couple more minutes left. Lots of questions. Um, okay, back there. Yeah. And maybe if we come to the point in which uh, AI just uh, discovers that we as a species are unnecessary, then everything goes on by itself and we don't have to worry about it anymore. <laughs> Hi. Um, well, sorry for my English. I will try. It's a difficult question. Um, but um, uh, you say that the uh, algorithm uh, could uh, he's the artwork, uh, but uh, um, do you think, or all of you think that uh, AI uh, could be um, a tool for artists also for um, a better world, uh, and so for ethical purpose and social purposes? For eth uh, I missed your... Ethical, ethical. role of mm -hmm. AI with artists in order to, I don't know, to help work and... Uh, I, well, to be honest, I find that the most frustrating aspect of AI is its ethical uh, boundaries. Because most of the things that uh, we really want AI to do the providers have put a very conservative colonizer point of view in which you establish the boundaries of how far AI can go. And I, you know, this is a, uh, it's like we're putting the kids on a, on a playground, a limited playground. And art comes from pushing those boundaries. And I think as more AI becomes free, and available and out of these leashed boundaries, the more possibilities will come out of it. And I wouldn't, you know, I, I have the same fears of ethics in society as I have in AI. So it's the same thing. You know, if you are unethical in the real world, you're gonna be unethical in AI. And it doesn't, it's not, it's not AI that creates the ethical boundary. It's us, and it's also our ability to decode the information. Okay, this is very important. Because I keep on listening to journalists say this all the time. How are you going to tell the truth from not telling the truth? Just like what we do today. Do you open the news and do you really believe everything that is written there? You have to have the ability to judge. You know, why don't we see all 
the, the scenarios that are happening in the world, why only some are selected to be seen and others are completely neglected? Why are the stories told biased forms? These are, these are in the table just the same way. And we have to educate ourselves to question what is it we are seeing. And AI is not a different problem. We've it's run out of time, mm -hmm. but I'm going to end with an unanswered question that hopefully all you can think about, but based on, on uh, off of what you were just saying, Marcello, does AI have ethics? Does AI, is AI capable of its own aesthetic and of creating something, of generating something of its own apart from the human element? So that's an unanswered question, uh, but you can hopefully discuss it uh, during some of the breaks with our excellent panelists. So I want to thank everyone here. Uh, for joining me to talk about this and to, uh, to uh, enduring my skeptical questions and introduce our next moderator, my colleague, Scott Rayburn. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.